This is White Coat Investor Podcast number 223, Cash Balance Plans. It's story time, brought to you by locumstory.com. Today we'll be reading One Job, Two Jobs. One Job, Two Jobs. Red Blob, No Job. Elective Doc, Emergency Doc. Some in overstock, some in out of stock. This doc is too abused. This doc is underused. This doc can't get sick. Say, let's try a brand new trick. For all the docs about to cry, here's an idea you can try. Look into a locum tenens assignment, a really great option. You might find it. With all this new info trapped up in your thinker, go to locumstory.com and use your mouse to tinker. It's here you'll find the unbiased answers you are after so you can decide if locum tenens is your next chapter. That's a fun ad. We need more ads like that. Uh, thanks for what you do out there. I know uh, you're a high-income professional, or you soon will be because you're a trainee, um, and there's a reason you get paid a high income. It's because your job's hard, but it provides an important service uh, to our society. So thanks for what you do. All right. Uh, if you're not aware of this, we have a conference once a year. We call it WCI Con. We don't call it that when we go to the people that we're trying to get CME for it though. We call it the Physician Wellness and Financial Literacy Conference. Our next one is going to be February 9th through 12th, 2022 at the JW Marriott in Phoenix, Arizona. Now, if you haven't been to Phoenix in February, it's absolutely delightful. Those of you coming from Alaska and Minnesota and Maine might particularly enjoy it that time of year. But our registration is going to open in fall 2021, probably about mid-September. So watch the monthly newsletter for announcements. You can sign up for that at whitecoatinvestor.com slash free dash monthly dash newsletter. Watch the blog as well. We'll try to make announcements on the podcast as best we can. Uh, But bear in mind, these things fill up and they fill up pretty fast. Uh, When we were uh, doing signups for our event in Las Vegas, um, well, our first one was in Park City, right? And we sold that one out in six days. When we went to register for Las Vegas, it was one third full after seven minutes, okay? And it was completely full after 23 hours. So when the sign up comes, you need to sign up if you want to come to this event. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have some awesome speakers coming. It's going to be great. Uh, and uh, it's great to meet all these people, you know, in the WCI community online, to meet them in person. It's just a really fantastic event. But if you want to come in person, you got to sign up right away. All right. I'm just giving you the warning. It's still a month out, but uh, uh, we'll give you the time that we're going to open up sign up and we're going to give you the date that we're going to open up sign up and uh, we'll be there to help you if you have any problems, but it's going to fill fast. So keep that in mind. We are going to have a virtual component. We really enjoyed doing the virtual component as part of, uh, as the only thing we had for uh, 2021 due to the pandemic. Um, And of course, that's not going to have a limit on how many people can come. But if you want to come in person, you're going to need to get signed up during that uh, sign up period. Uh, you know, we always offer early bird kind of pricing, but uh, pretty much everybody gets it because it fills during the early bird pricing period. OK, uh, let's uh, let's do an interview today. We're going to have an awesome interview. And uh, this is going to come from uh, a doc by the name of Victor Mingona, who you may know. He's been a part of the WCI community for a long time. Uh, but let's get him on the line here. All right. Our guest today is Dr. Victor Mangona. Welcome to the podcast, Victor. Thanks, Jim. Huge pleasure of mine to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's awesome to have you. Let's just start with a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how it affected your views on money. So I was born to immigrant Filipino parents, middle class income. They worked, they put us uh, into school and also had two rental properties uh, that my parents acquired during my childhood. And that kind of helped guide me toward the idea of investing. They weren't high earners, but they did uh, put in sweat equity and some capital into two rental properties. My dad's an accountant and he understood the numbers. And so that's how I kind of got started in the world of investing. Um, We didn't really have a lot of income. I never went on uh, luxurious vacations. I think I can only remember like two vacations my whole childhood going on. I didn't go on an airplane until I was 10 years old. Um, But you know, that set me up for my future where I had every opportunity educationally to attain whatever I really aspire to. So let's talk about that education. Tell us about your education and career so far and and what you do. So I went to Montessori school from PK through six, a Jesuit Catholic boys school until high, until 12th grade. I went to Duke for undergrad, Wayne State back in Michigan, my hometown for, for medical school. 
I did a, actually did two years of high school science and math teaching before I went back to medical school. And then I uh, did residency in radiation oncology uh, at Beaumont Hospital in suburban Michigan. And I did a fellowship at MB Anderson and now I work uh, in private practice. Uh, so interestingly, I, my, my experience as an educator started off in Montessori school, which is the reason I bring it up because that's part of the curriculum is learn and teach. And so I learned through school teaching my classmates ever since I can literally remember since kindergarten. And uh, I've always thought of myself as an educator, as one of my core traits and part of how I got into doing what I do now. Awesome. And, uh, and are you practicing full-time right now? So, so yes, I definitely am a full-time private practice physician. Uh, I work for a private oncology group in Texas, a very big group, 400 plus doctors, and I've been here. This is my first job out of training. We finished fellowships, my wife and I, uh, in 2015. And so I just, I'm about to hit my six year anniversary from starting my practice. I became partner after about two years and uh, the job has overall uh, been financially very, very fortunate um, that I ended up at this job. We've done very, very well. Good specialty. It's a good practice. You're in a good place. Uh, it all comes together, doesn't it? Sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I some of it was by accident, but getting two specialist jobs in the same city was very, very, very challenging. It happened a little bit by luck, probably a lot by luck, and it just happened to be that we were in Texas, which is probably the best state in the country for two specialist physicians, at least from a financial perspective. So, tell us about your family. So I'm married to my wife, Kate. Uh, She's a pediatric radiologist uh, academic at UT Southwestern. We uh, got married right before we finished residency. We went to residency at the same institution. And since uh, we finished training, we now had our third child as of eight days ago. Oh, congratulations. And I I understand there's a fur baby in there too. Is that right? Yeah, there is our first child was our our (laughs) fur baby, uh, our, our nine pound poodle. That was soon after we uh, finished training. And then uh, about a year and a half later came the, the first child. And now we're on our third girl in just under four years. Oh, sounds like you guys are going to get really busy. You've just switched from man to man to zone coverage. It is zone. Except we do have nanny coverage now, which uh, has helped keep it one on one, at least for the most <laughs> part. And her mom is helping us at the moment uh, while we just had the child. Actually, during the maternity leave period actually doesn't tend to be so bad on me because my wife does exclusive breastfeeding mostly. But uh, it's once she gets back to work, that's when uh, I think the, the real challenge happens for all of us. Yeah, I think you've got plenty of challenge in your lap with two uh, two practices and three kids under four. Yeah, you got a lot of work ahead of you for sure. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about finances. We're supposed to be here on a finance blog uh, you start or a finance podcast. You started a finance blog a few years ago. You titled it 39.6 after the highest tax bracket at the time. And the first time I saw that, I wondered if you would regret it when the tax brackets inevitably changed. Well, they changed. Do you regret that name? So when starting a business, I think the most important thing is to get started. And so, <laughs> so you know, you can look back and say, did I make the best decision? Maybe not, um, but I don't regret it because it was the first thing that I had to do to get started and it got me started. And I gave me some sort of a brand. I had considered more strongly changing it in the past two years. But then in the past year, I was like, well, at this point, I'm just going to write it out because it might come back within the next seven months or so. So yeah. we- then you'll look like a genius as soon as it comes back to 39.6, right? Yeah, I think it might get a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more press. That's the, that percentage might be out there. And then maybe, <laughs> maybe somebody will stumble upon uh, some of my content. <laughs> Now, uh, are you done blogging? What are you doing now? I understand you're on YouTube or what are you doing exactly? Yeah, I, uh, I gave up the, the written format. Um, I gave up the written format as my primary modality to, to share and uh, educate. I do basically all live broadcasts on, on my Facebook community, 39.6 community, and on YouTube. Um, I was one of those, I, I'm the type of person who's going to start writing something and if it doesn't have a due date, I'm going to continue rewriting that same thing and it will never finish. And at the end of the day, I was like, 
I can't spend this much time to produce so little content. <laughs> so uh, I, I switched media and I'm much better at verbally presenting and teaching than I am at, at writing out. And what's nice about doing a live broadcast is I start the live broadcast and I end the live broadcast and it's done. I don't do a lot of, I don't do any post uh, production. I, I've strongly considered repurposing and having some editing done, but at least this way I can sit down, spend half an hour and get something out there. And, you know, they say B minus work gets the job done. Uh, and I'd rather have a whole bunch of B minus work out there um, that people can enjoy and use however they want to than get a tiny fraction of, of A minus or A work. Now, I owe you a debt of gratitude. When the world was collapsing around us during WCICon uh, 20, and about a quarter of the conference faculty wasn't able to make it, you stepped in and gave a talk with about 12 hours notice, as I recall. And it was very well received. Um, I think your wife, Kate, uh, spoke this year at our virtual WCICon 21 and also did really well. But how did you get to be such a talented public speaker? Well, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, I actually... I did not know about the deadline last year for the applications. And then I was like, oh, I missed the deadline. I found out after the fact. So I kind of was bummed out I didn't apply, um, but I was there and um, I, I love giving public presentations. Now it's interesting. I didn't do like debate or forensics or any of those things in, in school. And even when we had like plays, I didn't like to do plays uh, in, 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 in high school. So I kind of attributed to two things. One, again, I love teaching and I've always been a teacher. Uh, but two, my, my parents started me in violin when I was like six years old. And one of my teachers, when I was in middle school, high school, she actually had us do a recital every single month. So I had to prepare and perform something new every month for, for probably years. And that repetitive nature of performing um, got me past that kind of the stage fright, you still have some stage fright, but uh, I really started to uh, enjoy that opportunity and being able to perform. And um, I spent two years teaching and I become, became very comfortable teaching, talking to crowds and often actually doing things with very little preparation. I think that's actually one of my strongest skills is being able to uh, not quite just do improv, but be able to be ready to, to speak on a moment's notice, which basically what we, what we did last year. And it was a great time. I had uh, an excellent time being able to, to, to give my lecture and talk to everybody afterwards. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. So your talk there was about cash balance plans. And somewhere along the way, you've developed an expertise on these somewhat unusual and surprisingly physician-specific retirement accounts. How come you know so much about cash balance plans? So I'm in a very large group, like 400 plus people, maybe similar to, to your group size. And people say changing things in our group is like redirecting an aircraft carrier. So it took years of prodding, but at the end of the day, I had to convince enough people to make this happen. And I was not going to get there without having basically expert knowledge in this area in order to convey enough information to get enough people on board to instill a change in a group that's a large group of mostly older physicians. Which, uh, you know, is exactly the kind of group that, that should consider a cash balance plan. So you had a, you had a pretty easy sale, even uh, at least once they got the information about them, at least. But for the sake of our listeners, can you explain what a defined benefit cash balance plan is? Okay, so excellent. So uh, that is actually the right term. So defined benefit cash balance plan is a type of a defined benefit plan. And when we look at retirement accounts, we basically have our defined contribution plans, like a 401k where you define how much you're putting in, like 19,500. And you have the other end, which are the defined benefit plans or pension plans. And a lot of people think of the old school pensions, like what people would have gotten, let's say, if they work for IBM or Chrysler, Ford, GM where you get a certain amount of money per year after you retire. And a lot of people in academia have those types of pensions. A cash balance pension, a subtype of defined benefit plan, lies as kind of a hybrid between the two. It still falls on the category 
as a defined benefit plan, but its purpose is designed not so that you have an annual income distribution after you retire or an annuity per se, but that you take the lump sum. And that lump sum is a lump sum at any point during the entire time you hold on to this every single year when your account gets credited, there will be a certain amount of dollars, cash balance that you have assigned to you that you know that your balance is worth, as opposed to other traditional annuities where it's kind of a black box where you don't really quite know how much your pension is worth. Um, For example, Social Security, we know kind of how much we put into it, but there's no lump sum option, Social Security. I don't think it would really work if that were an option. And you don't know at any point in the process what it's really worth. A cash balance defined benefit plan has a clear balance directly associated to each individual person who is participating in the plan. And uh, so essentially, it's another 401k masquerading as a pension. Yes, a a wolf in sheep's clothing, or uh, I like to call it the mega side door, mega back door 401k, because it's so much extra capital that ends up in your 401k. Yeah, that's a good way to think of it. So who should consider a cash balance plan? So anybody who has extra money to invest beyond their 401k, that's basically a prerequisite. Because if your 401k is all you can put in anyhow, then that's all you need. And this is for people who are able to save extra, uh, preferably people who are at a high tax bracket, like 30% federal, or have a high state tax rate. Um, 20% federal tax rate, maybe, and depending on your total financial situation, but these are really more for people who are at the higher tax brackets and trying to save more in tax. Uh, if you're trying to seek early financial independence, this is also an excellent vehicle to stash money away tax-free on the way in or pre-tax and have that growth and then allow you to reach the net worth number sooner based on uh, saving on that tax. All right. So what about, uh, you know, you mentioned your practice, right? It's a pretty profitable practice. Doctors are making quite a bit of money in the practice. A lot of them are older uh, and this worked out really well for them. Lots of them are putting lots of money away. Um, you know, what about younger doctors? Is this worthwhile if you're in your thirties still, you think, uh, even if you want to save, if, assuming you want to save more than your 401k can put in, is it worth it if you're only 35 or is this really something only people 45, 50, 55 plus should be thinking about? Well, absolutely. So if you're at a high tax bracket and you are, you're not able to take a lot of other deductions like business deductions, if you're paying a high marginal tax rate, it is very difficult to beat the savings of a pre-tax investment, no matter how you invest, especially when you look at it from a risk-adjusted net return perspective. So yeah, even at the age of 35, potentially you could get in $77,000 into a cash balance pension um, based on uh, last year's numbers. And that's that's still a lot of money. Um, Is it as much money as some of the older docs? Certainly not. Um, But if you're able to put that money in and the cost to you as a participant is zero or negligible in comparison to their tax savings, definitely is something to look into. And uh, I've seen a lot of people who are younger who have written off these plans because they've heard that they shouldn't because they're too young, but really you just have to run the math. And I mean, if you have a cash balance pension that's offered to you without any cost to you, and you can participate it and take advantage of pre-tax investing, then absolutely. I would do that way over doing a a backdoor Roth. Okay. So uh, pretty much any doc that's making decent money and saving a lot of money, it's going to work out for. Um, I typically see them in physician partnerships. Private practice partnerships is where I typically see them. Have you ever seen anybody at a university, an academic doc with a cash balance plan? I have not yet because from my experience and looking at the people who have those, at those big academic institutions, they often already have some sort of a pension plan already in place that is more on the traditional benefit side, which is what we often see in government organizations. Um, now, certainly there could be a transition to a cash balance type of defined benefit plan. And I know a lot of for-profit institutions have tried to convert because it decreases the liability risk to the company of having to pay out an annuity at the time somebody retires, but that's much more difficult 
in general, once you have a plan in place, um, this is a lot easier for uh, plan places that don't have something in place already. Uh, you can just start it up and set it up this way. Uh, cash balance pension plans did not really become clearly documented until 2015 um, with what we call market-based credit. Uh, it was about a, a decade before that when the Pension Protection Act basically legitimized cash balance pension. So these are relative newcomers to uh, investment vehicles. And so uh, a lot of older institutions, academic institutions have been in place a long time before this, uh, couldn't have really had cash balance plans before they uh, before this uh, 2006 ruling. Really now, what about for an independent contractor, right? Uh, I understand now you can go to Schwab, uh, some other places, and get a personal uh, defined benefit plan, a personal cash balance plan. You think it's worthwhile for them as well? So if you are a 1099 contractor, you're one of the best people to strongly consider it because one of the biggest downsides of having a cash balance pension is that your money is pooled with other people. But if you are the entire pool, then this really becomes an extension of your 401k. So in a lot of ways, they are the best people uh, to take advantage of them. Now, there are some other things that do come into play. The profit sharing portion of your 401k may be decreased. You may not be able to get that full $58,000 between your 401k employer and employee contributions. Uh, you might have to decrease the employer contribution. But if you can open up that cash balance side, it can be well worth it. Uh, and at Schwab, I had uh, just looked it up. Uh, recently, they had updated their pricing, but it's like twenty-two fifty to set it up, and only seventeen fifty a year going forward. Um, so that's uh, pretty cheap, two thousand bucks a month. I'm uh, sorry, a year, and that's an expense to the business, so that's tax deductible. Uh, and if you're putting in fifty thousand dollars and saving twenty thousand dollars on that, um, that's an incredible benefit to you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it, it's unfortunately due to the fact that, you know, actuaries have to get involved and it's more complex. It, it's significantly more expensive than a solo 401k, which you can open with basically no costs. Um, but, uh, you know, you can't put $150,000 into a solo 401k either. So that's, that's really the benefit. I mean, if you're in your fifties and sixties, the amounts you can put into these things are pretty impressively high. I mean, you can get $200,000 plus into a cash balance plan, uh, in the right situation. Um, but you know what, despite the maximum contributions to plans that can be surprisingly high, um, why do so many plans have such low contribution amounts? Like my practice is plan, for instance, we were, uh, the old plan we had was $30,000 across the board. That was the most anybody could put in. And the new one is kind of age-based when the plan started. And so I'm locked in at just 17.5 is all I can put into our cash balance plan right now, which is lame, right? Because I'm in my mid 40s. I should be able to put in 100, um, but I'm stuck at 17.5. Any idea why people set them up this way in order to? Uh... Yeah, this is a really good question because when you talk to different, so when I had to go shop around for different, uh, different administrators and different actuaries when we were getting it together for uh, our company. And it's interesting, you can talk to 10 different actuaries and get 30 different plans uh, in terms of how it's designed, right? And so it's really important to find out how much people wanna put in first a priori and then design it around that. But people don't wanna say how much they're going to put in until they know what the plan is going to be and how it's going to work. So you get into this circuitous route of not actually accomplishing anything. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's surprising how variable the setups can be. Um, there are, remember this is a defined benefit plan, not a contribution. So it's the benefit that technically has to be decided upon and that's in IRS guidelines, but how you calculate what that benefit is, is a lot of actuarial magic, right? So you can take different presumptions and different things and make the plan look differently. Uh, so for example, we uh, set a threshold that it could not, could not credit any account by more than 5% in any given year. And by doing that, it decreased the total amount that the account could grow to over time, which allowed us to contribute more money. Now, you also have to consider the demographics of your group because of the way cross-testing works and all the other employees. Um, and so uh, 
based on your age and how much it can grow to based on the age of the other employees and how much their benefit can grow to, uh, it can be limited. And then further, a lot of times groups don't want to allow contributions to go so high because anytime you have a pension, it is a liability to the company uh, on paper. It is, it is an employer uh, liability if there's, if there's a shortage. So they could limit the amount that goes in because they want to limit the risk to the business. Uh, and sometimes uh, different uh, partners may not want to take on risks of other partners. And uh, they agree upon things that for example, if you told your group, different people can get different numbers of vacation days. And then people said, well, that's not fair. The only way to be fair is to give everybody the same. And then you all decided, well, that's what we're going to do. It's going to be the least number of vacation days of the range. And there you go. It's fair. <laughs> um, and that's actually, unfortunately, what you often see in, in partnerships, right? Because it's only fair if it's equal. <laughs> so. Um, I don't know what went on during the design of the plan. Um, I would certainly shop around and see what other options there are available, see uh, how different plans could be designed. Um, with market-based crediting, uh, which allows you to credit amounts that are variable based on the returns of the investment, it can take a lot of that risk off from your company. And you can design your partnership agreement such that the risk to the company may be also mitigated by some personal uh, liability to the person if there's a shortage. So we have it designed so that our company can claw back any shortage that potentially is associated with somebody taking out money that is less than the actual amount of money they have in there. Or if their hypothetical balance is more than their amount of invested capital in the fund. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we're talking about this risk, I mean, what we're talking about happening is that the value of the assets in the plan fall, you know, big bear market happens, but that's not such a terrible thing in a partnership because what you do in that situation is you put more money into the plan. So basically what that forces you to do as a partner is to put more money in during a bear market and actually buy low. It's a wonderful benefit not so much a risk of being able to put even more money into your retirement plan at exactly the time you want to put more money into the retirement plan. So I think that risk is overblown quite a bit. Um, obviously, some people are going to have cash flow problems doing that, but it's not nearly as bad of a risk, I think, as some people make it out to be. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, we actually surveyed, and this is probably the reason why our limits are so low in our plan. Only 8% of the doctors in my group max out their cash balance plan. And that's so, a limit of 17 or a limit of? Well, it, 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 this, this was the old plan. The old plan was 30,000. Everybody could put in 30,000 a year. Uh, but only 8% of the docs were doing it. And so there just isn't that much interest. The vast majority of people were contributing the minimum, which I think in the old plan was 2,500. And uh, so I guess there's just not that much interest in doctors in, in saving much more than they can put into their 401k. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the issue. But why do you think so many doctors don't want to save more? Well, ultimately, um, it's interesting. I, I think a lot of this comes down to uh, misunderstandings and it comes down to education. Um, I think a lot of people, when it comes down to just saving more, a lot of people just don't realize how much they really need to be saving. Um, and a lot of people think that maxing out a 401k, you check off that box, your to-do list, financial to-do list box, and you think you're, you're accomplishing your long-term goals. But you really have to work backwards and say, how much do I need to be saving? Not, can I fill up this bucket, right? Um, for example, if you're making $500,000 a year, your 401k, $58,000, that's 11% savings rate. Um, that's not going to get the job done if your spending habits are that high, that you're spending all the rest of that money after tax. Uh, so what I did when I first presented this to my group, I said, you know, we all have to be saving at least 20% to safely, to safely meet our retirement needs. And when the average person or the median person is in the top tax bracket, that 401k doesn't even get them to a 10% savings rate. And so most people, I think, who are earning that high of income 
are actually not saving as much as they need to be. So uh, first step is, are you at least getting job, you're getting the job done of what needs to get done? Oh, if you're not, well, here's a vehicle that will really help you get there a lot faster than investing on the taxable side. It kind of takes away a lot of the decision-making. I think that's why 401ks are so effective. Well, there's a lot of people can argue that they're not effective, but part of the reason why they are effective is because they're, the, 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 the pain points to participate are very minimal. You can just participate at, you know, in a target rate, target, uh, target based plan and based on your age or whatever year you want to retire. And at least you're investing, at least you're getting something in there and your savings rate is really the, the strongest predictor of your financial security long-term. So ultimately it comes down to, I think really just understanding, uh, understanding how these plans, plans work, that the risks of the plans really are not as, as bad as uh, people make them out to be, like, like you're saying. Uh, certainly c- cash flow risk, I think, is something that people get scared of. Um, they may be living paycheck to paycheck and they see the money was good this year, the past year, and sure, I could do it this year, but I don't know what's gonna happen next year. And uh, I may have a, a kid going to college in two years and I may have to spend that $50,000 for, for college tuition. And then I, the year after that, I might have another kid going to college. And so that cash flow issue um, certainly becomes a risk, but I think that uh, is the minority of people. Now, when I talked to one of the actuaries, uh, he said that in a lot of business groups, it ends up being about one third, one third, one third, where one third are all four participating, one third definitely won't, and about a third may. And I, I, I probably worked harder on this one thing than I had done on many other things my entire life was getting this plan going. But we got 174 participants uh, in our first year. And that was, uh, people were getting mostly between 50 to $100,000 uh, per person. And that's uh, in a group of around 400 people. So we were almost at half. And then the following year, we added uh, another 32 people. So I, I think we're at about 50% participation um, just after one full year cycle of it. Uh, I think that uh, when the new tax rules go into place, uh, I know there's going to be something different about them. Um, we can all comfortably say there's going to be some sort of increased tax for the highest earners, of which most of my partners are. I think there will be a much stronger impetus to participate because now we'll be on the higher uh, end of the scale of where tax brackets have been. Whereas during this past administration, we've actually been on the lower side. Um, so bumping up to you know, 39.6% uh, marginal tax rate. And for people who are like in California, where you could be easily adding another 10, 11, 12% on top as a state tax rate. I mean, you're looking at marginal tax rates of 50%, uh, which that's just, uh, and that's before accounting for, for Medicare tax. So uh, I, I think that once people really understand, uh, if you're in a situation where you're in a high tax bracket, if, if you have the, the cash flow ability to do it and you understand that where you are financially, what goals you need to meet, uh, I think a lot of people um, will participate. Hmm. Now, uh, obviously it's tax deferred money. So you're getting the same tax break you are in your 401k. But you like to talk about a permanent tax savings for W-2 employees using a cash balance plan. Explain what the permanent tax savings is. Yeah, so... Like in our group, all partners are paid straight on W-2. So when you earn W-2 income, you get paid on a W-2 paycheck, you pay Social Security until you hit that wage base limit. And then, and you also pay Medicare tax on all of your money. So as an employee, you pay 1.45% Medicare tax on all of your earnings. You pay an additional 0.9% on all your earnings north of 250K if you're married. So that's 2.35%. And the employer is paying 1.45% on all dollars that are paid to you on your paycheck. So in total, that's 3.8%. So if you own the business, you are both the employer and the employee. So if I'm putting in $100,000 into my cash balance pension, I'm saving $3,800 in Medicare tax uh, for me and for my employer because that money is bypassing payroll. That's one of the biggest benefits of bypassing payroll is you get away from those payroll taxes. That's why a lot of people who are in an S-corp structure and they design it that way because it helps them avoid putting money on payroll. It shows up on their W-2 as opposed to on the K-1. 
um, or it shows up on the K-1 instead of the W-2. You don't have to pay payroll tax on K-1 income. Um, so, um, but as a W-2 employee, if you can save that 3.8%, that's a guaranteed savings. So that money is never going to have to be paid back, at least based on all the data we have on tax deferred plans. I mean, who knows what's going to happen 30 years from now, but um, there's no plan, at least in the way we design 401ks, uh, to pull back Medicare uh, payroll tax uh, down the road. So that's a, a huge benefit. That's a guaranteed permanent return and that you will you will never uh, never lose. Awesome. Great. I like how you put that. All right. So inside this plan, you got to invest the money. The money's got to be invested and, and you don't get to control that as a participant. The company controls that or the plan controls that. Uh, how do you think a cash balance plan should be invested? Uh, how does your group do it, for instance? Uh, so uh, first of all, you want to maximize your tax savings. You want to limit the liability to other people in your company. And you want something that will work with everybody's portfolio. So we designed something that could work for the people who want to have the most stock heavy or the most bond heavy portfolio overall. So we designed ours to be 40-60. So that's 40% stocks and 60% bonds. Uh, And we have our money set up at Vanguard. It's almost all index funds. It's a little bit of active management on the bond side. But at 40-60, the downside risk is very low. The, The risk of losing more than 10% the year is very low. So this very much limits the liability to other people and the company. Uh, And people who are putting money in here already are putting $58,000 into their 401k and probably investing more otherwise. So your cash balance pension is just a portion of your portfolio. In aggregate, if you want to be 80% stocks or you want to be 80% bonds, you can still likely get there. And even if you're not, uh, you can have a wide range of asset allocation with very similar outcomes. Uh, The driving force here is that tax savings, that will drive up your overall compound annual growth rate to favor maximizing the cash balance plan contribution more so than just what's your overall asset allocation. You wrote wrote a great blog post about how many other asset allocations there are. All right, so let's talk about that loss. What happens in your plan if there's a loss in the account? So first of all, you might have an account that's already overfunded. So our account, fortunately, is overfunded. Now, we had over 10% return last year. Uh, and our cash balance pension caps the crediting at 5%. So all of that extra 5% is just extra. It's sitting in the account. So, so this year, we could have, let's say, a 2% loss. And all of that surplus will help take care of the deficit. And we would still have extra cash to still credit people with a positive return. We could still maybe give them two or three percent for next year. Uh, And so it really depends on the situation. Now, if there is a loss and now you're underfunded, where the total amount of the balances of the people in there, their hypothetical accounts, is less than the the total aggregate amount of the the pooled pension, um, then you're underfunded. And so you have to make this up over a period of time. Now, from my understanding, you have a seven years of an amortization schedule to make it up. It's highly unlikely that that balance over seven years is not going to come back above zero, right? So you have to potentially float it uh, for a while, but it's likely going to get back up there. But one of the benefits, again, of having that cap on earnings is allowing people to contribute more, but it also allows us to have a surplus. And that's something that was really important to our company. We're a very big company and uh, having a a plan where you can have some padding and some cushion, it puts us in a a position where we're much more likely to keep that plan going. uh, And a lot of people can can just breathe a little bit more comfortably, not knowing that we don't owe millions of dollars uh, to people, even though it would get taken care of, uh, but still, you know, if it went down 50%, I mean, we're, we're at probably 20 million plus in our, in our fund. So a 50% drop would be $10 million. That's a, a, lot, of, a lot of capital. Um, so we still don't want to have that liability on our books, even though over time it should correct itself. And the amount it takes to, to fix that over time is, is very minimal, uh, relatively speaking. Um, but yeah, technically, 
you do have to come above water over a period of time. But in most practical scenarios, it'll come back above water on its own anyhow. And a lot of people would say 60-40 is actually pretty aggressive in a cash balance plan. A lot of cash balance plans are even less aggressive than that. Yes, absolutely. Some are like 30-70. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about asset protection. I mean, these are uh, ERISA accounts. They get the same asset protection as 401ks. They get that federal asset protection, correct? Absolutely. And that's one of the big benefits of this is that um, it is uh, ERISA protected, or sorry, ERISA protected, and it's a qualified plan. So it's not subject to the risk of creditors. And so uh, you can actually um, keep this and no one can come after this. And it's, it's a lot safer than putting money, for example, in just a regular IRA, um, which doesn't have um, that ERISA protection. And IRAs are variable based on the state and different things. But um, absolutely, this is ERISA protected. All right. So how often can you close a cash balance plan and what happens when you do? So this is where there's uh, you get different answers from different people. Um, but 10 years is a very comfortable number to work with. I, I had um, had somebody I know talk directly to Schwab about their plan, and they basically have an off-the-shelf plan, and they design it for 10 years. So uh, 10 years is super safe. Once that 10 years is up, you can close it down, and you can roll it over into your 401k or into an IRA. At least that's based on what we know now in 2021. There could be changes tomorrow, okay? Now, seven years is also probably a good number. I know a lot of people use seven years as their plan for how long to keep this open. Uh, and I've heard some people go down to as low as five years, although I've definitely gotten more hesitation from actuaries about planning to close a plan in five years. Um, but seven years seems to be pretty reasonable. Um, that's maybe where we're going to aim for. Um, and once you close it down, you could open up another one. So once it's closed down, that money just stays pre-tax if you roll it over to another pre-tax account. So it really is, like I referred to earlier, uh, a mega backdoor 401k. Yeah, exactly. That's the point of these things. The point is not to leave it in the, uh, the defined benefit plan for 30 years and then annuitize it and live on it as a pension in retirement. The goal is to get it into your 401k or your IRA. And so closing it is not necessarily a bad thing. The only downside to it is you have some additional, you know, legal and actuarial expenses when you close it down. So that's a good thing to close it. But the IRS doesn't want you to close it very often, or it looks like you're not actually trying to set up a defined benefit plan in the first place. Um, so seven to 10 years sounds like five to 10 years or a change in the business. For example, that's what happened in my group. Um, you know, we ended yeah, for sure. We, I've been in this group for 11 years. We're on our third cash balance plan. And the reason why is because uh, we keep expanding the partnership. You know, uh, when you add t twice as many partners as you already have in the partnership, it's basically a new business. We joined a new business. And so we got rid of the old cash balance plan, started a new one. Uh, I'm not sure I like the new one better than the old one, but here we are. And the nice benefit is each time I did that, I was able to roll that cash balance plan into another plan. So yeah, I put mine in my TSP. It's invested in the G fund. Um, uh, you know, the only downside to that TSP for me right now is I can't do Roth conversions in the plan, which I'd like to do and haven't figured out a way to do that. But who knows, maybe the TSP will allow that in a couple of years. You never know. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, another uh another aspect of these, which is for older docs. If you get to be 62 and a half, I understand there's a kind of unique provision in a cash balance plan that allows you to immediately roll the money out of the plan. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So this is how it really is a, a backdoor or side door 401k, because if you are uh, of age, as soon as that money is vested into your account, you can roll it out. So for example, the way ours works is they withhold it from your income uh, over the course of a year. So let's pretend I put about 100000 a year. Uh, I put 100000 100, gets withheld gradually from my income, let's say 8000 a month. And then at the end of the year, that money is kind of, uh, has already been all reduced from my W-2. And then usually what we do is in March or April, after we've done all the cost testing, they do the profit sharing contributions for the 401k and they put the money and vest your account on the cash balance pension side. Okay, so that includes your new contributions, but it also includes the crediting of the prior balance. So 
Um, if the balance was zero last year and I put a hundred thousand this year, uh, once that hundred thousand dollars vests into my account, if I were of age, I get to roll that immediately over. It's just like doing a backdoor Roth. It goes into one account, it goes out of that account into the place where you want it to be, and it maintains the same tax deferred status. A backdoor Roth that maintains the post tax status. However, um, and one of my listeners fortunately told me about this uh, earlier this year, but with the CARES Act. They actually changed it now from 62 to 59 and a half, the same as 401ks. So if you're 59 and a half, you can put in your 19,500 into your 401k. Uh, and as long as your plan documents allow this, this is, you know, this is permitted by, by the IRS rules, but your plan documents have to still have uh, whatever provisions. So you put your 19,500 in, um, you can roll that out immediately. The profit sharing 401k and the cash balance pension that we get all vested in like April, we could roll all of that money into an IRA immediately if you're 59 and a half years old. Um, and so it's really an incredible vehicle for, for, the, for the older doctors because then they don't have to worry about this cooled asset. They don't have to worry about the, the downsides as much. Um, they will be able to have control of their money basically immediately or within about a year or so. And so um, it's really a great vehicle. Um, if you have a group with a lot of older doctors, um, this is just, uh, this takes a lot of the risk off the table of the company and it just allows them to basically add more to the 401k. There's not really much downside for those people at all. Yeah, it's even bigger than catch-up contributions on 401ks and, and HSAs and Roth IRAs. All right. So does everybody have to contribute? Uh, do all the employees and partners have to contribute? Do they have to contribute the same amount? How, how is that determined? Yeah, so this was actually one of the sticking points that I found out about why our company had not started a plan previously, because they had had presentations from Fidelity um, and people were hesitant to open one up because we do have a wide range of income across our partners. But you actually only need to have 50 participants or 40% of your employees. So and we have over like 400 doctors. So it only takes 50 of them to say that they're going to participate in order for us to be able to keep this open. Uh, if you're in a small group, like 10 people, you only need 40% of them or four of them to participate to, to keep it open. Now, even if you have like three doctors and 10 employees, you can still include one of your other employees in the plan just to meet your numbers. And they would have this cash balance pension um, as one of their benefits. And often you may have to do that just to hit the minimum threshold to get the plan going. And it can be well worth it for the tax savings. Um, but absolutely 50 people or 40%. Um, and then the amounts that they contribute, the maximum amount that each person in our group is allowed to contribute is based on their age. And our plan is designed between 50%, I'm sorry, 50,000 up to $100,000. As their maximum amount, they don't have to contribute that amount, but they have to make, make an election of how much they do want to put in, and they're kind of locked into that uh, for three years, uh, and that's just to make it look like a pension as opposed to a defined contribution plan. You have to have a steady amount you're putting in. Now, you can also design it so that it's a steady percentage of your income, and this, for example, if you're a 1099 person and you really don't know where your income may be from year to year, you can have a lot more safety potentially if you do it on a percentage basis as opposed to a flat dollar amount. So you don't have to worry about earning as much. You just have to make that percentage. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of variability. Not everybody needs to participate and not everybody needs to get the same amount, which gives this um, uh, opportunity for the people who want to participate to participate and makes it a lot easier to get a plan open uh, in a private group. What about the non-highly compensated employees and the 5% rule and non-discrimination testing? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is where it gets complicated. So if you're a 1099 doc, the part of the real benefit of this is you have no other employees that you have to worry about. It's just you. Now, you could work with a, in a group where you're just doctors, all highly compensated individuals. Those are people who own or sorry, who earn more than $130,000 per year. And it's kind of similar to the Social Security wage base. Um, but if you're a physician and you have employees like nursing and other staff uh, who earn less than 130,000, then the IRS says, if you're gonna have this extra retirement plan, you have to do it fairly. 
And that is, you have to make sure that you're giving enough money to the other non-highly competent employees. This is the same thing that you have to do with a 401k, especially if you have a profit sharing 401k where you're adding on beyond that 19.5 and adding another $36,000. You have to make sure that the employees who are earning less than 130 are earning enough. That's why our 401k, we don't do any of the profit sharing contributions to people's accounts until after the year's over, up until like March or April, when we've done all of that, we call cross testing. So that cross testing is uh, one of the tests, non-discrimination tests that have to be done, where you look at what percentage of a, of their, of a person's income is going into their retirement contributions from the employer. Um, across the participants in, in the plan, uh, the cash balance plan, as well as people who are non-participants and the people who are earning less than 130. To make it simple, for most people in most plans, you're going to have to give 5% of a contribution to those non-highly compensated employees. We call that the 5% gateway. That's the minimum they need to get. So if you have an employee making $100,000, that employee will need to get $5,000 into their 401k as an employer contribution. Now, that's for basically all of your non-highly constant employees. There are some people you can leave out. For example, people who are new and haven't put in as enough hours yet, they can be excluded from that. But everybody else has to get at least 5%. Now, if they get 5%, then yes, you can have a cash balance pension and give um allotments of contributions to participants. The amount of that allotment is going to change based on how much you're getting to those other non-highly competent employees. So it could be 5%, it could be 6%, it could be 7%, or 7.5%. And basically, when you talk to an actuary and get um, a plan design made, they will often make a design of how much people can put in based at those different levels. Uh, and if you get to the seven and a half percent level, then you can get these skyrocket high numbers where you can get almost $300,000 for people who are 62 years old uh, into their cash balance pension in addition to their 401k. Um, or sorry, uh, yeah, 300,000 in addition to the 401k. But that's at seven and a half percent. If you're at 5%, uh, it's it's interesting. The numbers will a be lower, but instead of the numbers increasing as people get older, there can be another test that also gets in the way, where you end up getting this bell sh- bell curve shape contribution limit. Where in our plan, it's the people who are uh, between forty to forty five actually who are getting the most uh, amount in, and the people who are uh, older are getting. Uh, less in, yeah, $45,000, we're able to get, uh, at 45 years old, we're able to get about 100000 uh, to our partners. And then the people who are 65, it's only like $50,000. Um, and so it's, it's just, um, it has to go down to, it goes down to the demographics of your group, the age of the employees, uh, non highly compensated, the age of your uh, partners. Uh, and sometimes you might have some people that throw it out of whack. You might just have to have give some employees a little bit extra into their 401k to meet the cross-testing. But this is really where the actuaries get get paid. This is super complicated. Uh, I'm explaining it at basically the level I understand it, and that's basically the limit. Uh, These calculations are so much more complicated. I've talked to multiple actuaries. I'm like, can you just please teach it to me so I can understand it? Because I'm an engineer. I can figure this stuff out. But this is like, this is actuarial math. This is really complicated. and uh, it really depends on a lot of the presumptions that are made and how, uh, how it's designed. Uh, I saw multiple plans where one of the plans that was offered to us literally excluded everybody under the age of 40, can't contribute at all. Um, and then you could give more to the older people and then same people, different option. Yes, you can give it to people who are younger, but then it affects people older. I, I don't understand how this all works, um, but you have to be giving them 5% as a minimum. And fortunately, and this is probably the only reason why we were able to get it open in our group was because we were already giving them 5% um, as a 401k contribution to all the non highly competent employees because we had to do that to make sure we hit our profit sharing numbers so we could get the 36.5 or 37 or whatever it is in a given year. 
in order to max out the profit sharing to all the shareholders, we had to give 5% across the board. Now, I wanted to juice the plan up. I wanted to get up to 6% or 7 or 7.5% and really increase the numbers. It wouldn't have helped me as much as it would have helped the older docs who wanted to put in 200 plus. But for every percent we were going to add to the employees, it was going to cost over a million dollars. And to get a plan started that people still have this real black box about how this is going to work, and then you tell them it's going to cost the business a million plus, you're not going to get a lot of people who are going to raise their hands. Um, And that cost, that additional cost was going to be ultimately divided across all the participants. So the fewer the participants, the more it was going to cost each of us. And if it's going to cost one person $10,000 to make up that extra percent because you don't have enough participants, then it becomes really not necessarily cost effective unless you're getting a really high number. So again, it goes down to the demographics of your group and how many people are participating. Uh, we have a like a 10 to 1 proportion of non-highly compensated to highly compensated people. And so that's like an average number, maybe. Uh, some people work in groups where it's like five to one or three to one, and it can make it a lot easier. For us, for every percent costing us seven figures, um, that was going to be, a, that was an imp- it was that was going to shut the, the plan down. It was never going to get off the ground. Now, I aspire to bump it up to 6%, 7, 7.5% with a change in the plan as we get more people involved. If we're at 200 this year and next year, if we get to 300 and the tax brackets go up, this will be like, I mean, if the tax brackets go up, I'm going to be paying a lot more tax. That's fine. But the silver lining is it'll be a lot easier to get A, more participants and B, people more willing to pay a little bit out of their pocket to their own employees, right? Who are our own staff. It's not like we're paying to the government, but pay a little bit more out of their pocket to really crank up that tax savings. If, if someone's being able to save an extra $100,000 and that could be worth $40,000 federal plus the 4% on Medicare, it's 44,000 bucks. Even if you have to pay a few thousand dollars to your employees, um, that's well, well, well worth it. So that's what I'm hoping to happen this year, at least by 2022. Yeah, the key with employees is getting them to appreciate what's coming, right? If people are realizing how valuable that benefit is, well, maybe you don't have to give them a raise. And so it's not a complete loss, you know, for instance. All right, let's, uh, we're starting to run short on time, but I wanted to talk about one more topic about these cash balance plans. A lot of people want to invest more aggressively than their cash balance plan is going to invest. Maybe they want to invest in real estate or Bitcoin or whatever. And they can't do that, at least not easily in a retirement account. How would someone decide whether to fund their cash balance plan versus going and buying a property or a syndication or something like that? Yeah, this was actually the biggest bone of contention I had with the individuals trying to sell them on participating. Um, If you're at a high tax bracket, you're paying 40, 50% marginal tax. That money is gone immediately. That is gone. You're not going to have that money back. It is very hard on a net return risk-adjusted basis to get ahead of that tax savings with any return out there. Um, if you're starting at the, if, you have a, if I'm running against, let's say, Michael Johnson, he was fastest man in the world, and he's starting and running 100 meters, and I'm running a 50-meter dash. Now, I used to run, and the 50-meter was like my event. This is like in middle school because they don't have it in high school. But there's no way the fastest man in the world will beat me running 100 meters compared to me running 50 meters because I have such a large head start. And that's basically what you're doing here. $100,000 into a cash balance plan would be like sixty dollars or $50,000 in your pocket to invest. Now, certainly you could invest it somewhere and make huge returns, but those are not risk-adjusted compared to the 60, 40 or 40, 60. So the risk adjusted return is still gonna be way higher if you can save that 40% tax. And so that's what I tell them. And ultimately, again, this is a small portion of your total portfolio. There's room in your portfolio for even the most conservative assets. If you wanted to have 70% of your money in more aggressive things, then that's fine. And this is still a small portion and it's pre-tax. 
So it's good to have that diversification and that tax savings. It's just so hard to get ahead of it. And I invest a lot in real estate and I expect to get great returns in real estate, but on a risk adjusted basis, still not going to get there at, at my tax bracket and definitely not next year. Or at least I wouldn't expect to. Um, certainly you can overperform, but those are, that's uh, based on volatility, right? That's not necessarily expected. All right, now we need to wrap up, but you've got the error of 30 or 40,000 high-income professionals that are going to listen to this podcast eventually. What have we not talked about today that they should know? So there, there are three things I want to bring up. One is on the offense side financially, a lot of people worry about the return of their investment of their investment capital. But what we don't often talk about, which I think is far more appropriate or far more meaningful is the return on investment of yourself. You invested so many years in college, med school, residency, fellowship, et cetera. And how often do people negotiate their salaries? Uh, how much more could you be earning doing the same exact job in a different place? Okay. Um, your earning potential, you've already invested all that time and effort. If you put in as much focus into maximizing that ROI, you're going to get a lot more gains than you will spending time trying to, trying to bump your ROI 1% or 2% here and there on a portfolio, okay? Now, on the defense side, we talk about often liability, uh, sorry, life insurance, disability insurance. But really, the biggest financial impact, potential catastrophe over your life, not included those, is your marriage. And this is what my wife talks about a lot. And this is what she talked about at uh, your conference last year is, investing in, in your marriage. And it's something that we often don't uh, prioritize and put a focus on, but there's the easiest way for a doctor to uh, have much more difficulty long-term is to, to go through a divorce. So investing in your marriage is so unbelievably important and often not talk about, talked about. The, the last thing um, about avoiding catastrophes is, I'm actually, I, I used to be right on your page when it came to, to cars, I bought a thousand dollar car in his high school. I bought a six thousand dollar car right out of uh, college and an eight thousand dollar Honda Civic right out of residency. Um, but in the past few years, actually in the past one year, I've completely changed. That's because things have changed. I highly recommend anybody buying a new car or buying any car. The first prerequisite for a vehicle is to get automatic emergency braking. There's now enough data out there about the improvement in mortality and morbidity of accidents and avoiding accidents that helps you A, financially, but also just the catastrophe of, uh, of an accident from your personal health, but also your financial liability. Because there's very few things on a day-to-day -day basis outside of being a doctor that either A, you could die from, or B, you could be sued for and lose a lot of money. It's a car accident. So automatic emergency braking, it, it will cost you more. It's hard to get a vehicle without it for less than 15K or so. Um, but a lot of the cars now are coming out with them for you know new models as standard. In a handful of years, are gonna be standard probably across the board. Um, but this is probably the biggest uh, improvement in, in car safety. And I, I think for any high earner, any physician, it's of very high importance. Uh, and if you have kids, keeping them rear facing, let's make a plug, keeping them rear facing as long as possible. Uh, AAP recommends up to age four, if you can, uh, is highly recommended. I used to be a biomedical, biomedical engineer, did my research on cervical spine flexion and extension injuries. Um, I mean, children, the highest risk of death between one to five is, is an accident. Um, so automatic emergency braking and keep your kids rear facing as long as you can. It's a pain. We have three rear facing. It's not, not enjoyable, but these are things that you can do to save lives. And it really does save lives and money. 2018 and newer, right? For automatic emergency braking, that's when it came out? 2015, it started to come out, but it's usually like only on the top trim level vehicle. So it was really expensive to get that. Um, now uh, you can get base model cars, like a lot of the new Kias uh, and Toyotas um, have AEB on even the base models. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, in the past few years, it's become more and more and rear automatic braking, there's actually some data that's come up, that came out this year that uh, it not necessarily improved mortalities, morbidity, but it was cost effective and saves money because there are a lot of insurance claims um, that would be avoided 
is rear automated braking. And that is something um, that is hard to get on a lot of vehicles without going to higher trims. But when we got, uh, my, so we all think we're above average drivers, um, but we have a nanny, we hired a nanny last year, who's gonna drive our kids to school. And so now I was willing to pay for whatever I needed to. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't matter what I was gonna pay. I had to have the safest possible car uh, on a, on a cost effective basis. So I got a Subaru Ascent with basically automatic, you know, automatic emergency braking, rear braking, you know, uh, cross traffic alert, which is so helpful when you're parking in parking lots at schools. Um, and, uh, also, you know, blind spot monitoring, uh, those things. I, I think these are so valuable. It only takes one act, like literally one fraction of a second com completely change your life medically and financially. Um, and so I, I very strongly, um, recommend this uh, for any high earner. I think, uh, Pennywise pound foolish uh, at this point. Now it's 2021. Three years ago, I don't think there was much data on it. But now there's enough data that I think as a physician, I think we're doing making the wrong decision um, by not doing that. Now, I, I wish I could say that all of our cars have these. Um, we don't yet. I'm trying to cycle them out. Um, and over the next year, probably will have. Uh, but at least we have one. That's our primary vehicle for, for, our, for our kids. So I, I think that's something that uh, we as physicians, and you're an emergency doc, so you see these traumas. Um, not that we want to cut down business, but certainly <laughs> nobody wants to increase our, if we have an easy way to decrease uh, car traumas um, that money can pay for, and not necessarily a lot of money when it comes down to it, 15K we can get you there, um, then absolutely we should. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Victor Mangona, for coming on the podcast today. It's been wonderful to have you here. And uh, I suspect a lot of people are going to be a lot more interested in cash balance plans after listening to you. Thank you, Jim. All right. Hope you enjoyed that interview. Um, cash balance plans. I've been using them for years. Uh, they're a great retirement account. They're a great uh, asset protective account. Uh, it's really worth looking into. Uh, for doctors, the story has changed. Visit locumstory.com to see if a locum tenens assignment is right for you. It's here you'll find the unbiased answers you're after so you can decide if locum tenens is your next chapter. Don't forget as well about WCICon 22. It's February 9th through 12th, 2022. Save the date. We're going to be in Phoenix. Registration is going to open in September. Watch the monthly newsletter for announcements. You can sign up for that free monthly newsletter, which includes a blog post, essentially, that doesn't go out on the blog. It only goes out in the newsletter at whitecoatinvestor.com slash free dash monthly dash newsletter. Please leave us a five-star review and tell your friends about the podcast. Uh, our most recent review comes from Go Goats, who said, highly recommended for other professional pilots. Jim's clear, prioritized, and fact-based financial advice is excellent. Binge on all of the podcasts and blogs during your overnights. Keep your head up, shoulders back. You've got this and we can help. We'll see you next time on The White Coat Investor. My dad, your host, Dr. Dahl, is a practicing emergency physician, blogger, author, and podcaster. He is not a licensed accountant, attorney, or financial advisor. So this podcast is for your entertainment and information only and should not be considered official, personalized financial advice.